Yeah, so I'm Becca White. I'm the state representative currently for the town of Hartford. Uh, I grew up in the village of Wilder, which is a one of the five villages in town, and now I live in White River Junction. This is my back porch. Uh, these are my chickens, who you may see. Uh, and in Hartford, uh, I went to the high school. I went all years through the public school system and then went to the University of Vermont, graduated and moved back. So I didn't actually spend that much time outside of town, but I did get to explore when I was in college and travel. So coming back home when I was 20, uh, I was interested in public service and getting involved in local government, thought I would go on to the planning commission, uh, and then decided to run for select board. So I got elected when I was 20 to be on the select board. Uh, that was a huge honor. And after four years on the board, I ran for the open seat for the state rep position, which we have two of in our town. Uh, and then uh, now, four years after that, now I'm 28, I'm running for the state senate position, which is all of Windsor County. Um, the important thing for people to know about me uh, is that I uh, grew up in a situation where we were a no frills household and we relied on uh, social safety net programs and community support to actually be able to maintain a standard of living. <laughs> and I feel really fortunate to uh, have grown up here because I've seen the comparison of where you have children who don't have that situation. Uh, so my public service largely revolves around lifting up people who are in that situation and responding to uh, proactively not having those situations occur at all. Um, yeah. So what were some highs and lows of your house experience with regard to the reasons that got you into politics in the first place? Oh gosh, highs and lows. Well, uh, the big high of being in the state house, uh, and for anyone who's been to Montpelier and has been under the Golden Dome, there is a sense of gravitas and excitement and it felt like getting, as I've heard others describe it, like a master's degree in Vermont. And you just suddenly are opened up to all these new people and ideas. And yeah, you just, it's just a moment of growth. And I didn't expect necessarily to grow as much as I did. That was a huge high in the fact that I expanded my own perspectives and met new people who I would not have interacted with otherwise. And that means age, um, largely the state house is um, older, so I'm one of the youngest members and would actually be the youngest woman elected in Vermont history to the state senate if elected. Uh, so getting to interact intergenerationally with people was actually a big high. Um, the low would certainly be the lack of pay. Um, lack of health insurance and trying to balance having an income and maintaining a home uh, while also serving publicly. So that's the big low is it's not the work of doing it. It's trying to give myself space to be able to properly serve the constituency while balancing the fact that I'm not independently wealthy or retired, um, which is difficult. But uh so far, so good. <laughs> right. well, what do you think, what do you feel like you've accomplished in your time in the House, and yeah. what unfinished business do you want to continue doing in the Senate? Oh, gosh, there's so much unfinished business. But my main accomplishments that I look to um, include two pieces of legislation that I personally take a lot of pride in. There's a lot of work that we did as a caucus, because I'm a Democrat. The Democrat caucus accomplished a lot. But uniquely, I would say my fingerprints are on the Transporta Transportation Modernization Act and the Transportation Innovation Act, two bills that came out of the House Committee on Transportation, which I served on, that looked at the um, crossover between climate change and responding to some of our infrastructure challenges. And that those two bills were a part of a new strategy um, that had never been employed a, uh, by a legislative body in Vermont. Um, so it not only is a bill that's like an omnibus bill that we moved, it is also a new strategy in how to accomplish some of those goals. Uh, and the strategy is that we have a transportation budget bill that comes out that the administration, the governor, introduces every year. And that's great because they're coming from the staff 
budgeting perspective. But what would happen is they'd bring that bill to the House committee and you're just nibbling at the edges. You're not really able to introduce as an elected official a clear budget that is your own vision. You're not able to put your priorities out there. So both of those bills were introduced and worked on with the administration prior to them introducing their large transportation budget bill. So what ended up happening is we worked with them to get to a point where actually the bills looked pretty similar when you broke them down. And then we were able to negotiate on the finer points that the House committee was set on and that the administration might have some need to learn more about or to be pushed on or to learn on our end that it wasn't going to work. Um, so that's really my big accomplishment, I would say, is working on climate change legislation in the Transportation Committee while also learning how to work with the administration to move forward some of those big priorities. Um, and then there's a lot of work that the Democratic Caucus did uh, around uh, reproductive justice. That's really personal to me, and the proudest vote I ever took was on um, the bill that we did prior to moving Proposition 5, the Constitutional Amendment, um, the Reproductive Liberty Bill that codified Roe v. Wade. That was one of my, that was the most impactful vote I've ever taken on the floor. Um, Global Warming Solutions Act. There's lots of bills that you get to have a part of and move as a team member in the House. And when you asked about unfinished business and going into the Senate, my understanding when you compare the House to the Senate is the House is 150 people. You work as a team and committee. And in the Senate, there is a lot more independence uh, that also requires a different kind of teamwork. Um, and I'm there's a lot of things that I wanted to accomplish in the House that I can see moving forward into the Senate and just trying to navigate how to build a team of people in a coalition in a new setting is going to be the challenge. But I'm excited and I think I've got the experience to do that. Well, so what are, what are you mentioned climate change. Yeah. What are some other challenges that you see Vermont facing in the coming years that you feel will be, um, you'll be focusing on in the Senate? Yeah, so I have campaigned on, I call it the three E's. It's a little hokey, but it really fits with what I'm hearing from people at the door. Door to door knocking is my main form of campaigning at this point. Uh, and that's economy. And I think of that with economic justice more than like economic engines, uh, environment, so climate change, uh, and then equity. So how do we include equity into the systems that we have in our state so that the most vulnerable people aren't left behind? Um, all of those E's actually hit on a really central theme that I've heard throughout the campaign, which is housing. Uh, Windsor County in particular, uh, or actually the Upper Valley, I should say, um, Vital Communities did a housing seminar. And the number that they told us of missing units, meaning we have people here who want to live in these houses but don't have them. We're about 6,000 units short of what we need in the Upper Valley right now. <laughs> uh, and that's not even considering the amount of growth that we've had and are expected to have in the next five years, which will make that demand even greater. Uh, so housing is a big piece that kind of hits all three of those E's when you think economy, housing is the stability you need to have an economic engine, workforce housing. Then when you've got uh, environment, weatherization, renewable energy, energy independence, and then with equity, who can afford a home? Who can afford their rent? How do we keep people in situations that they aren't spending the majority of their income just trying to maintain a house, whether that be the cost of the house or the utilities? So with regard to housing, can you talk a little bit about what was passed last year? I know there was a lot of federal yeah. money coming into the yeah. state. Um, how is that going to be used to help solve this problem? Yeah, so I should say that although I like to think that I'm the affordable housing like cheerleader, and actually this house was purchased through an affordable housing program through Twin Pines Housing Trust, um, Allison or Allison Clarkson, who is also one of the three um, on the Democratic ticket running for state Senate. She is the champion in the Senate for affordable housing and housing um, infrastructure. So I don't want to take too much of her thunder. Um, but what we did in the House side was move out of housing and general affairs 
uh, a slate of legislation that moved forward programs designed to help people who were struggling to afford their home uh, to purchase for first-time home buyers, uh, to have um, specialized loans. So lots of different programs to help people in the process of either purchasing a home uh, or making their home um, available for um, expansion with ADUs. Um, the federal money that we got from ARPA was all used for the most part. Uh, and then when you look at the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, there was money that I worked with on the transportation side but didn't spend a lot of time with for housing. Um, but they worked through a lot of programs that moved things forward. Um, I would say the most exciting piece of legislation that I saw on the housing front was just the sheer amount of money that went towards building affordable housing. Uh, and that's mixed, uh, that's multifamily units. Um, in high density areas uh, being the priority. So what what do you think is the best case scenario for, for closing this gap mm. between the people who need housing and having housing units available? Well, we have to do it. That's the first thing. There's no, it would be impossible for us to maintain the systems that we've built with the number of jobs that we have in the area uh, to not respond to the housing crisis. Um, the housing crisis also is causing homelessness, and that affects every single person in our state, where if you're on the margin and you're just one bad medical bill or car failure away from falling into homelessness because the cost of living is so high, that's a serious issue. Um, and when you look at like the food shelf, for example, here, yesterday there was, in the last two days, there was 90 families, you know, who would go in a day, or 90 households. Uh, so we're at a serious crisis point um, where people are making difficult decisions. Um, the dream, I think, is we need to have a very serious conversation about third and fourth house homeowners. Uh, and... I'm not quite sure what the solution is for that, but we are at a place in my belief in our history in Vermont where you can have a second home here, but I'm not comfortable with people having third, fourth, fifth homes in parts of Vermont when there are people who can't afford to have one home here. Um, we have a major contractor shortage, uh, and while it's contractors on all spectrums of uh, services, whether that be electrical, plumbing, weatherization. Um, what I'm also noticing is that there are enough contractors for wealthy Vermonters. There are certainly enough contractors for that group of people. There are not enough contractors for people who are trying to do um, basic renovations on their home, whether that be weatherization to save money on utilities or expanding and adding um, extra space to grow a family or to add an income um, in a home that could serve as an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, so I do think that equity piece comes into it and really right-sizing um, what exactly we need for uh, each individual person to be successful in our county uh, when it comes to housing. Uh, it's also about, uh, you know, the dream scenario would be limiting, uh, you know, I, I look at Just Cause Eviction in Burlington. I was very impressed with the work that they did with their charter change and was disappointed when we lost by one vote this last year to actually move that forward. I mean, that was the will of the people in that city. And that's really too bad that we weren't able to move that forward. Um, exploring just cause eviction in a charter change here in Hertford has been talked about. And I see Windsor County as a place that could move really bold policy forward to create a place where people are not in unstable renting situations that end up cycling into either a situation of being unhoused uh, or uh, having to move because there's a safer place or safer um, financial place for them to live. So I don't know what the solution is, but I'm really impressed with the amount of eyes that are on the problem right now. And since all of us are impacted by it, I think that we're going to see some creative solutions come out of um, the legislature this next session. Are we doing anything uh, with regard to like vocational training yeah. so that we can, so that we have more people going into the trades, so we yeah. have more people who can like make these make these homes that is such a good question and 
Representative Charlie Kimball, who also ran for lieutenant governor um, in the Democratic primary and is not running for his seat, um, was a big champion who I respect, um, who worked on legislation to move programs like that forward, to add additional supports for them. Vocational schools are the bedrock of how we in Vermont are going to be able to deal with that contractor shortage. So I'm the daughter of a plumber and electrician. So my dad has always worked for himself uh, and has worked to mentor folks who are coming up um, in the trade. And what I've seen over time is when I was growing up, you know, it was a little bit of, oh, you're a plumber's daughter. You know, like there's a little bit of a stigma to that. And what has completely flipped in my lifetime, however short it has been, is now people, when they find out my dad's a plumber or electrician, they want his number. You know, they want to know who he is. They want to know where he lives and they want to call him immediately. And so the demand is so great. I think that we're actually changing some of the stigma and stereotypes around going into trades because we're seeing the value of it and the living that you can make. Uh, so I really do hope that we're able to upfront fund some of the work that needs to go into the educational process. Um, whether that be the vocational schools or Vermont Technical College or just trade program, industry programs. Um, we moved forward. I, I was disappointed uh, by the fact that we didn't move forward a contractor registry. Uh, and that's a bit of unfinished business I'd like to look towards. I understand, especially small business owners, again, very personal to me, um, who say, I don't want another piece of regulation. I don't want to have to sign up for something. Why do we need a contractor registry? Well, it's twofold. It's There are contractors who are not doing above board uh, jobs, and we need to be able to have consumer protection. And then second to that, we need to get a handle on the situation we're in with contractors. Uh, and I hope that we can move forward on that in the next legislative session and in partnership with the administration because the reason it didn't move forward was because of administrative um, opposition. Mm -hmm. well, speaking of the administration, um, firstly, who will you be voting for for governor? <laughs> I know you're shocked, Brenda Siegel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think her chances are? Uh, that's a really good question. Brenda is a woman who I will never underestimate again um, because she spent, I mean, I don't know how many days she spent out on the state house steps making a point about unhoused Vermonters and the difficulty that they're experiencing. But the level of commitment she has to move forward the lives of our most vulnerable people, I was moved by that. Um, and felt that she did exactly what needed to be done by someone in her position. You know, when you have the time and ability to make that kind of advocacy stand so publicly, I was really impressed. So I don't underestimate her, but I also think that there it'll be a difficult race to overcome the uh, Governor Scott positivity affordability narrative that he's been able to craft. And you know, he's not uh, not someone who Vermonters fault um, for anything major. I mean, I, I don't know of anything that he's done that um, was done. You know, there's no bad intent I've ever seen in the work that he's done. And we've worked closely with, or I've worked closely with the administration on many topics where I appreciate the give and take. It does put a pretty low ceiling on some of the progressive work that we can do. Um, but I, I think that he does speak to a, to a identity that a lot of Vermonters have, which is they don't want a party to run everything. They want people to be in charge. And when you've got a split ticket like that, Vermonters are going to go towards it because they want to be able to show that there's still conversations happening between Dems, between Republicans. Um, and I think that that's going to probably carry forward. Um, and I will say, I uh, when you compare how he responded to COVID nineteen to any other Republican governor, I was I was very I mean, even my husband, you know, we would watch, you know, Dr. Levine and Phil Scott were regular voices in our home on a daily basis, and the comfort and security that that provided to us. Um, 
during that time, I really do appreciate the work that he did on it. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if that still remains a good positive feeling that all Vermonters will carry with them into the ballot box. Yeah. It's hard, hard to beat. It is interesting that Vermont has in the House and the Senate pretty strong Democratic majorities. Yeah. Super majority and, in the Senate. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, we've had a progressive lieutenant governor and we're likely to have another progressive lieutenant yeah. governor in, in David Zuckerman. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, Vermonters then elect a Republican governor. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of people say that it's they want to create balance. Yes. Um, which I get, but does that sort of stymie the more progressive things yeah. that the Democratic majority wants to accomplish? Yes. Or does I, it put a check on them? I think in the best cases, it puts a check. What I find most disheartening is it's actually an unfair, um, the power dynamic is unfair. So the governor and the administration has much more power, um, has staff time, has financial resources, has clout um, in a way that is outsized to all of the Democratic or Republican elected legislative body. Uh, so the fight is actually relatively unfair, in my opinion, um, because he can veto something and he's had the uh, he's used his veto pen more than any other governor in Vermont's history uh, by a pretty large margin of 10 or 11 bills, is my understanding at this point. And that does have consequences where we have elected a slate of people in throughout Vermont who are pushing forward ideas that one individual, for the most part, can stop. Um, and that's hard. And, and I would say the problem is that you have to get 100 people in the House to be able to support something. And when I look at, for example, the contracts we had with the pension and how we had 150 Vermonters who were elected as state reps, who, 149, I think we had one person absent or something. But, you know, like the full body voted for it, Republican, Democrat, progressive, independent. Uh, and then it was still something that we weren't sure if the governor was, was going to move forward on. So, yeah, as long as we can have a good relationship between the two bodies, I think if we were able to give more, um, a, more leverage for our elected leaders in the state house, we would have a better ability to combat the veto pen. Um, but it is unbalanced, unfortunately, at this moment, in my opinion. And what do you think the odds are of the Democrats being able to override future vetoes? I believe we have a very good shot at getting a majority. Um, in the Senate, I think it's an even better bet. And in the House, I think we'll see some really decisive races that will make that clear that there will be a majority in the House. Uh, and I'm working to help my friends who are throughout the state um, make that happen. Given what we're seeing nationwide with this this partisan divide <laughs> that seems to be uh, breaking down more and more and just devolving into just pure tribalism. Yeah. Uh, do you do you think that Vermont can we can sort of resist that? We can withstand that, or do you see um, any fractures in and, you know, this kind of civility that Vermont prides itself on. Yeah, that's the question that makes me most worried uh, because I do see some fracturing. Um, and I saw it before and during the Trump presidency uh, where the it felt like the volume was turned up. Um, and Vermont was even insulated from a lot of that. Uh, you know, I've had my personal safety, I felt at times was in more of the crosshairs. Um, but I have seen women of color in particular who are elected officials have a much more difficult targeted response to them being elected or even trying to do anything in public. <laughs> um, so that's where I see the fracture point, is people who have typically been not a part of the system uh, of governing, and when they're able to serve, 
not being able to have a safe experience. Um, so it's asking someone who is in the most vulnerable position to also put their friends, family, community in an even more difficult, scary place. So we l tend to lose, you know, as Susanna Davis has said really poignantly, we don't have a recruitment problem for people of color in our state. We have a retention problem. So that's where I see the main fracturing is can Vermont, can, can Vermont respond to white supremacy in a way that allows us to have elected officials who reflect the diversity of our communities who are also safe to participate um, in all forms of public life, whether that's local government or state government. Um, and I have also seen our community respond in ways that I haven't seen other parts of the country respond. Um, I'm really proud to be in Hartford, and I'm actually really proud to be on this street in particular, uh, because early in the pandemic, um, we had a gentleman who put a Nazi flag up in his window. And you could see the flag from our home, like we looked out the window, and one day it was just up. And my husband and I kind of looked at each other and were like, this is not okay. And it was also in that heightened moment where you're thinking, wow, this could, like, goosebumps, this could go really wrong as a nation, and I'm not sure what we can do. But suddenly, right in front of us on our street, there's someone who's professing the beliefs of um, Nazi Germany. Uh, so we, you know, we, I mean, like, we walked out into the street, and we're just like, what is going on? And then neighbors came out, and we're like, this is not okay, not on our block, not on our street. And out of that, we, um, we had a painting party, <laughs> and we... Uh, painted. We had all of our neighbors. It was a block party. You know, we're wearing masks outside. Like, this is real deep pandemic moment. And we painted No Hate on Hazen Street. We had um, a teenager who was in the process of transitioning who put up a trans flag. We had them all on the fences of this street. And he took his Nazi flag down. He replaced it with a German military flag. And then eventually that was taken down. But it was this moment of even if you're going to put something that offensive, inappropriate, beyond the pale on our street, you're not going to get any kind of love, any kind of silence on your behavior. Um, and I saw that that happened in a lot of different places throughout our state where people just said, no, not here. Um, and it wasn't a, you know, we didn't go up and bang on his door and yell at him. We said, as a community, this is not what we stand for. And anyone who's on our street should know that that's not what we stand for. What I see every day is the Vermonters are coming together and showing up in ways that say that that's not appropriate and that we don't stand for that behavior and that we're not going to support people who proclaim white supremacist views or far right extremist views or want to isolate uh, people who have been marginalized in our towns. When I see some of these symbols around or like Confederate flags yes, in Vermont, I know. It can't help but think that it's just, it's a, it's, it's a reaction uh, to something, it's it's just it's sort of an irrational response to feeling like you're being attacked yeah. or um, your side is losing yeah. and you have no other uh, recourse but to do something or display something that you yeah. know is going to yeah. just have a make, reaction. Yeah, have, just like make people mad, make yeah. people upset, and and that makes you feel better because you don't have any other power politically. How can we heal this growing crisis of people, uh, you know, getting behind these very fringe ideas by empowering them in other ways to make them feel like they have a voice in politics and that we should try to solve these problems civilly and mm. with dialogue? Is it possible? Well, I'd say that I have had that experience through local government more than I've actually had it as a state representative, although you still have those difficult conversations with people who feel like they're in an alternate reality to you. Um, but on the local level, that is where I see us making the biggest impact. Um, and you see it now where people will show up at select board meetings with very serious concerns that can't necessarily be addressed by a select board. 
um, but they're feeling that they don't have a voice that's being heard, that there's some larger machine that's moving things forward without um, taking in the perspective of like a real person. Um, they're concerned about a wealthy elite or a, an elite that is a woke elite. Um, it is really reminiscent to me of some of the talking points around Take Back Vermont um, and civil unions. And I think that we as a state were able to see through that rhetoric and move forward and prioritize the lives and well-being of, of same-sex couples. Uh, so I hope that we can do that again on a lot of different topics uh, in our state. I do think financial security is the ticket item. When you don't feel like you are, um, you know, when you feel like the world the, that you grew up in, you know, you, whether it was having a family where someone stayed home, for example, or having the ability to afford to go on a vacation once a year, like all of those things are getting stripped away from most of our lives where there was a sense of security and social mobility that has just drained um, out of most Vermonters experience. Um, and I saw that growing up after the 2008 housing crisis, my home was foreclosed on um, when I was growing up. And we also experienced um, some serious financial ramifications. So I can see how you can have anger that gets bred out of really desperate situations. And then you're looking for someone to blame. And it's it reminds me a lot of the affirmative action conversations where most people who are really upset about affirmative action are mad at um, poor black students for like taking their spot when in reality it's legacy students from wealthier backgrounds who are more likely to be the people who are taking the spot. Um, so for me I think about we need to come together as working people to recognize that there is extreme economic stratification and that economic stratification is not coming from people of color, it's not coming from um, LGBTQ couples. <laughs> it's not coming from most rural Vermonters. It's coming from a system that was built around capitalism. Uh, and for me, universal basic income, for example, is a key piece to responding to that. And I think if we put dignity back in the hands of people who have so often been told that they haven't pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, you're going to lessen a lot of the resentment and anger that has started to breed into our system. But that's a big, that's a long-winded way of saying that I think um, people who are hurt hurt other people. And when we give people good choices or when we give people good opportunity, they'll make good choices. So... We are recording on your back porch next to a daycare, yes. um, and so it might get a little loud, uh, <laughs> but this is maybe a good opportunity to pivot <laughs> to the question of child care. <laughs> well done. The child care crisis in Vermont. Yes. What can we do about that? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, what do we do about the child care? Well, we'd love to have another daycare here, you know, we'll uh, make that available to folks in the neighborhood. but. So I grew up, my mom ran a daycare when I was growing up, um, and it was a small business. Uh, she has a GED. She doesn't have any further education than that. And they changed the law in Vermont to require some professional standards, which are all well and good, but unfortunately made it so she could no longer um, operate her um, daycare. Uh, and I don't disagree with that legislation or that move to professionalizing um, early childhood education, but I do think that we're in a situation right now where we need Vermonters who can afford quality childcare. And so we either need to subsidize that or we need to create situations where people can have um, more community care. So I've seen creative things happen like in Pomfret, for example, um, uh, soon to be hopefully Tesha Bus state representative uh, was a big part of um, a child care center there and helping to fund and make that a community space. Um, but then there's also uh, just frankly subsidizing child care. And I think that that's where we're at is a Vermonter who is spending, I mean, when you balance housing, then you balance child care costs, that's almost all of uh, a young family's income. So they have no surplus. Uh, and that puts them on a really thin tightrope. Um, and it's scary. And when we talk about young families, 
uh, and how we want more young people and young families, we need to prioritize making it affordable because the people who can have children are wealthy and not the people who, um, and, and that's not ethical in my opinion. <laughs> like you should, I mean, I know a lot of people who my age who would love to have kids but can't afford to have children. Um, and may never be in a position where they can afford to have children, which is heartbreaking. Um, yeah, so subsidizing childcare. Uh, I would love to see us uh, expand pre-K. We need to make sure, like the intergenerational nature of childcare. <laughs> I mean, I look at Vermonters who want to be able to be more a part. I mean, they want to be a part of their grandkids' lives and they need to be able to afford to live here to do that. Or they want their grandkids to live closer, so they won't need their children to be able to afford to live here. Like, there's a way that we can do child care that is more of an approach that um, I think we all want to see our kids experience, um, but the affordability of doing it is hard. Yeah. Um, and speaking of state subsidies, with regard to telecom and cell service and internet, it does seem like the only way to really make that happen is through state subsidies because the companies themselves, it might not be in their financial best interest to build a cell tower in a rural place because they're not going to profit from it. Yes. So the state needs to or step in. Or not quickly. In, not quickly, right. So is the state, are we prioritizing state dollars in building out broadband and putting up cell towers? Yeah, well I'm really impressed with Representative Tim Briglin who is not running for re-election and the work he did on the Energy and Technology Committee in the House uh, and having those districts, you know, internet districts like EC Fiber for example, um, giving those locations funding to actually roll out a network seems to be the next big step. Um, for me, I think of, I'm considered an internet native, like that's how I grew up. Um, and that's because my dad was really interested in the internet and computers. And he was actually one of the folks who installed the first computers at the Vermont Law School. So he was very on the ball with that. So I've been following what role the internet has played in our lives. And it's now required to be economically, uh, it's an economic advantage. So we are actively disadvantaging rural parts of our state by not having them get quality internet or quality cell service for that matter, which a lot of people are using their cell phone like a computer at this point. Um, that's where they do most of their emails, if you're like me. And I do think that funding those um, telecom districts, giving them the ability to govern, um, to have a governing board, all of that stuff, creating the uh, kind of the administrative infrastructure for them to function seems to be the groundwork that we've laid over the last few sessions and now it's about making sure that they can be um, financially self-sufficient because it's not going to be an overnight economic win. It's going to be something that takes time to develop and I think about electricity and how Vermont, one of our last towns, it was like the 70s or something that we had electricity go to the last town in Vermont and we can't do that with the internet. That's too long for people to wait. Do you feel like Vermont's getting back to normal after two years of pandemic life? For some people, they're getting back to normal. Um, I work at the Upper Valley Food Co-op now, cashiering part-time, and that's a really interesting place to get a slice of how people are responding to the pandemic. We still wear masks. We still have the shields up at the food co-op, um, and that's in part because I'm interacting with so many people that just that kind of makes sense now, health-wise, for me to wear a mask. COVID or not COVID, like I don't want to get the flu, I don't want to get your stomach bug, I'm interacting with a lot of people touching their food. Uh, so I want to make sure that I'm safe as, a, as an employee. At the same time, I'm interacting with people who are making decisions about masking or not masking. I make, I'm having conversations with people who are buying vitamins, for example, who want to stay healthy. And the thread of conversations that I seem to be having now are divided between people who are really moving back to normal, but struggling with the transition of like social interaction and like, what do, what do I want to do now that I have full range to do things again? Do I want to go to a concert? Do I not want to go to a concert? And then people who, because of um, being immunocompromised, being older, being in a vulnerable health situation or having young kids who can't be vaccinated, who are still actively avoiding um, 
those situations. So there is a bit of a divide right now between who can go back to quote unquote normal. Um, and I, I don't know where we're going to end up in the next few years. I think we'll always have some of this and we'll always have a season where people are going to be masked. I guess the one thing we haven't talked about is Windsor County specific issues, uh, which our county is the largest geographical county of any district from my understanding. Um, so it has a really big diverse collection of people, both very rural, downtown, um, and then we've got kind of the suburban tourist condos as well. We've got a really interesting mix of people. And I think Windsor County, the thing that I want to express to anyone who's voting, is Windsor County has a special opportunity to act really boldly in the next few years to benefit our communities. And that can be in responding to the opioid crisis, that could be investing in affordable housing, that can be being ready for the green economy and adapting. Um, to that economy. Um, it could be supporting families. Like we have so many things that as a special place that we are with the right, what I feel the right ingredients for changes, um, that I'm excited to be in the state house and represent regionally this area. Um, because I'll talk to people in Ludlow and I'll talk to people in Chester and Hartford and Woodstock and Springfield, and they all have different challenges but largely it comes down to the same three things, which is like the three E's I was talking about, is you're either dealing with economic problems, equity, or the environment. And for us to be able to act responsibly to respond to all of those problems, we're gonna need a big coalition of people who are willing to speak up and voice their perspectives. And it's gonna take a lot of people to do that. Um, so I hope that um, if folks are voting in November, that they're also thinking about how they can advocate after that, uh, because voting is a great first step and it's necessary, but we also need people who are willing to communicate with their elected officials, uh, as well as uh, work with us. Um, so whatever happens in November, I want um, whoever gets the positions to have an open door policy. Um, so that we can do the bold work that Windsor County has to do. So in, in conclusion, you're campaigning for one of three Senate seats. Uh, what are your campaign plans and how can Windsor County folks uh, get in touch with you? If folks want to get involved with the campaign, the first thing they should do is just check out, I have a website, um, BeccaWhiteVermont.com. Uh, they can learn a bit more about me, about my background. They can check out what I do on social media, which is an interesting part of the campaign. I'm, again, the youngest person running for the seat, and I do use social media as an outreach tool, and that's kind of new to this race and to this seat. Uh, so I'd love to connect with people in a way that is easiest for them. Uh, they can shoot me an email, which you can find on the website. They, I, my cell phone number is out there, which is its pros and cons, but I definitely accept phone calls and text messages. Uh, and then if there are uh, people I should get to know, like if you, I'm from Hartford, so I know this community really well. I like to think I know the rest of the county really well, but I'll meet someone who's working on a cool project who I've never met on a daily basis. <laughs> Uh, so if there's a cool thing happening or a creative thing that's happening in your town, like I'd love people to reach out and tell me about it um, because it's only going to be helpful for me to do some early studying on uh, what this district is looking to see from its elected leader. Um, and then if folks want to go door knocking, it's a really good experience. I love to door knock. I'm, I train people on it. Uh, even if you're brand new to it, I guess my pitch would be, it is fun. If you want to go out with me in your neighborhood, in your town, knock on some doors, get to know your neighbors. Uh, it is one of the best ways to just get right to the heart of grassroots politics. And you'll meet some incredible people and you'll have great stories. So I recommend if anyone wants to get involved with the campaign to think about going to the website. And also if they want to do the tactic of door knocking with me, I, uh, I love to take people out. Okay. Well, thank you, Becca, for your time yes, today. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your service. Thanks for running for office. And best of luck on the campaign trail. Maybe we'll catch up with you again at a later date. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you for doing this. And go local cable access.